1 Corinthians 15. Paul has been teaching the Corinthians about how they can get back to Jesus to rebuild a foundation and begin to grow and mature into maturity. And so uh, he's been dealing with various issues in the church. And one of the issues that we see here in chapter 15 is that the church, uh, some in the church are saying there's no life after death. There's no resurrection, that this life is all there is. And so Paul gave us the gospel in verses one through 11 and explained that, you know, the resurrection is a big part of the gospel. So if there's no resurrection, no life after death, there's no Christ rising from the dead and therefore there's no salvation, we're in, a bit, in big trouble. So he explained how our faith is incompatible with the rejection of life after death in verses 12 through 19. So since Christ did rise from the dead and we will rise from the dead as well, how does that work then? What does that look like? Well, the rest of chapter 15 will be about that. And today we're gonna look at one specific area. You know, recently there was, I don't know if you knew this, but there was a lot of hubbub about the end of the world. You know, Christian people coming up with numerology and all sorts of weird things and saying they knew that the end of the world was on the 23rd. Um, you and I never need to get caught up in such nonsense because the Bible speaks plainly about it. Like I don't need to look for codes in the scripture. The Bible gives us a very clear outline about the end of the world. And so as we examine the end of this life and the start of eternity this morning, you know, may it fill us with great hope and spur us to share our faith more than ever because of what's at stake. So chapter 15, verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ is coming. Then comes the end, when he shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father. And when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now, here we see here the fact of the resurrection. Now Christ is risen from the dead. And there are results from that. You know, in contrast to a faith that's worthless, if there is no resurrection of the dead, and therefore Christ doesn't rise from the dead, instead of us being the most pitiable people on all the earth, we have this awesome hope of life after death through Christ's resurrection. So it mentions here that he was risen from the dead. You say, well, that's simple, Will. That just means he came back from the dead. It's a little bit more detailed than that. That word from means from out of, and it refers to from out of a group. In this case, the group of the dead. It's not a band. This is everyone who has ever died. Everyone who has ever died. Now, if, for extra credit, who are the two that haven't died? Enoch and Elijah, right? You gotta, if you called out, you got extra credit. You just take it up with the Lord, he'll take care of it. So, But those two didn't die. So Jesus, he is from out of the dead. He rose from out of that group of everyone who had died. So everyone is gonna join that group except for Enoch, Elijah, and those of us who are alive when the Lord returns. So out of that group, he rose out from out of it to life. And because of that, it says he became the first fruits of them that slept. Now, what's interesting is Colossians 1, verse 18, and Revelation 1, verse 5, you can look it up later, it calls him the firstborn from out of the dead. What does that mean, and is that different? It's a little different. Being the firstborn is not the same uh, today. You know, back then, if you were the firstborn, it meant you were the most important child, right? How many of you firstborns out here? All right, we're all the most important kids, right? All right the rest of you guys are just peons, Okay. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It wasn't even that back then. But there was an honor conferred upon the firstborn child in the sense that they were to carry on the family name. So they would get a double blessing, a double inheritance. So it's not that other kids weren't taken care of and they weren't special, but there was something unique to that. So firstborn doesn't speak of birth order in the sense of you were just the firstborn. It speaks of preeminence. It speaks of a privileged position. And so Jesus, of course, when it calls him the firstborn from out of the dead, he is the preeminent person to come back from the dead. None of us will compare to him. But first fruits harkens to something else. It means the same thing, but it 
has another connotation to it as well because it reminds us of the Feast of First Fruits in the Old Testament. Now, we are far from that. In fact, where we're at right now, while people got mixed up with the whole end of the world thing is because there are three feasts that are going on in this time period for the Jewish people. You have the Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, Rosh, head, you know, the other one means of the year. So you have the start Jewish New Year. Then you have the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, which is either now or coming up very soon. And then you have the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkoth, which will be coming up in a few weeks. Those were the last three feasts. Well, the first three feasts that were done are way back when where we celebrate Easter. And that was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was preparing for the Passover. Then you, at the last day, you would celebrate Passover. And then the day after that, you would celebrate the third feast, which was the Feast of First Fruits, or the beginning of harvest. And you would go out, and the very first harvest of your fields you would bring in, because you've been taking all this time off for the other celebrations, you'd go out and work. You'd bring your first harvest in, and you would bring the first portion of what you harvested to the Lord. And they would take it, and they would wave it back and forth before the Lord. And what it signified was that, Lord, my entire crop belongs to you. You are the source of of my harvest. I know you own it all. So I'm giving back this portion to you to tell you that I know that. And I thank you for a bountiful harvest, okay? So while it does speak of Jesus' preeminence being first, as the first to rise from the dead to never die again, because others have risen from the dead like Lazarus to die again. But it mentions here that he is the first in order in the sense that there's others coming. He is a guarantee of our resurrection by being that first fruits. The idea that the rest of the harvest is gonna come as well. He's that wave sheaf of wheat, the first portion of humanity destined to arise out of death who will live forever. So you might be saying here, but wait a second, Will. Why does this say he's become the first fruits of them that slept? The word there, slept, slept, means to experience death, but why do they use the word sleep? Sleep isn't death. We don't go to sleep when we die. Well, why does the Bible call death sleep? Well, first off, it only calls it that for believers. Those who die apart from Christ are never said to sleep in death. So why are believers said to sleep in death? Well, it calls it sleep for believers because this is the body's condition at death. You know, we, if you've ever been, you know, to an open casket, they usually, you know, prepare the body in such a way that it will look as close as it was to the way you want to remember them. So they usually show them peaceful and with their body intact and not maybe bearing any of the marks of of an illness or what took their life. So, you know, we see that. And the idea was, is because, well, it's them. And yet, of course, it's not them because their soul and spirit has moved on. But the idea is that the body's still there. It's just not functioning. It's not animated anymore. It's like it's sleeping. So the idea here is that my body can't express who I am anymore, so the body is asleep. But eventually, it will awake as God gives me my new body. He'll resurrect that body. and, And as a result, it will come awake again, and I will be able to express myself through it again. So that's why they call it sleep. The third reason the Bible calls it sleep is because there is no death for the Christian. See, the Bible defines death as a separation of the soul and the spirit from God. And that never happens for the Christian, you know? A Christian never experiences this. In John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, Jesus, in responding to Martha, who said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother Lazarus wouldn't have died. What did Jesus say? He said, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he is dead, yet shall he live. He that believes in me shall never die. That's a crazy radical claim when we see death all around us every day. And yet he makes that claim. And then he turns to her and goes, do you believe this? And of course, what does Martha say? I do. I do. I believe you're the Christ, the son of the living God. I know you can do that. I I do believe that. So see, Lazarus wasn't dead, you know. His body was just waiting to be reanimated, you know. And someday, if any of us were to pass, are to pass on in Christ, that will be our experience as well. So we don't experience death. There is no uh, death for the Christian. Now, while we sorrow for our separation from that loved one, they never experience a separation from God. In fact, it has far more in common with saying, good night, I'll see you in the morning, than with goodbye. Now, on the other hand, when I say goodnight, I wake up a little discombobulated in the morning, so it's much better to say that with the Lord. You know, I woke up this morning, and it was all dark out because of the storm clouds and everything, and my wife was missing, and it was all tragedy. So, you know, I was all discombobulated. You know, but when when you go to be with the Lord, you know, you take that last 
painful or whatever, you know, barely able to breathe breath here and you say goodbye and then you inhale there and all is fine and you're with the Lord and so shall we ever be with the Lord. There's no delay. There's no time of waiting. There's not a big escalator that you got to go up and wonder where it leads. There's not some funky guy who's glowing at the top going, let me show you in. And you're going, no, no, I want Jesus. And guess what? He'll be right there. How do you know that? It's in the Bible. Remember when Stephen was stoned? What did he see? I love it. He saw Jesus. And Jesus wasn't seated at the throne, but he was standing ready to welcome him in, you know? And that will be the case with you as well. It was the case with everyone who has died in the Lord. So why does Jesus have this preeminent role though? Why did he rise from the dead, but others didn't? Well, just as man got us into this mess with death, it would take a man to get us out of it. For verse 21 says, since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection from out of the dead. See, Jesus succeeded where the mankind had failed. You know, death didn't exist until humanity sinned against the Lord. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now, you can't blame Adam for you, the fact that you're going to die, because you made the same choice when you decided to sin at some point. But death was not part of God's plan. It didn't come into the world until humanity sinned. So we made this mess for ourselves. As a result, it will take a man to get us out of this mess, which is why the incarnation is so important. Jesus had to step into our world. Even though he's fully God, he had to become fully man to fix what Adam brought about. Now, he did not lose his deity at that point. He didn't stop being God and become a man. He was still fully God. In fact, he must be fully God to overcome death. That's the only way he could overcome death. Let me ask you a question. How many, how, how many people out of 10 people die? Studies have concluded 10 out of 10 people die. Did it? It's true. That's what studies have concluded. Every study, 10 out of 10 people die. Can you beat death? Listen, <laughs> no matter how healthy you live, you may, you, may, you may do this thing called run. Like you might, yeah, I know. I see something, I'm going, no way. And I'm, like, I'm with you. I only run when I'm being chased and then it might not even be worth it either. Some of you guys exercise. You're really into that, you know, and that's good, by the way. I'm not, I mock it, but it's only because it makes me feel better. So, but, but you guys, great, good, keep doing it, you know. You exercise, you're really healthy. You know, you, you watch what you eat. You, you know, I, I watch what I eat, but you know, I watch it go into my mouth. But I, 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 watch, I watch what I eat too. I, I count my calories and stuff. But some of you guys really know, you know what's in everything and, and stuff like that. And you really get into it. That's great. But can you still beat death? I don't care how healthy you are, you're not gonna beat death. People can leave here today and go, Pastor Wilson, I can eat whatever I want. I don't need to exercise. It's futile, I can't beat death. But no matter how healthy you live, you're gonna die. You're gonna die unless the Lord returns. So the reason is because you don't have life in and of yourself. You don't. You can't create life. You don't have life in and of yourself. But here's the cool part, God does. See, in John chapter one, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. He has creative power. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Why? Next verse. In him was life. That word was, it means to exist. Life exists in him. It sprung forth from him. He has life in and of himself. So he has the ability to create life even if he's dead. So, you know, you and I can't do that, but God does do that. Only God makes such claims and can fulfill them. And so Jesus did. In John chapter 10, he said, my father, he he has has given all things unto me. Why? Because I lay my life down. And he said, I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it back up again. I don't have that power. If my life goes down, I lay down my life for my family or for a friend, or if it's just time to give up the ghost and I go, I don't have the power to go, ha ha, just kidding, you know, three days later and go, I'm back, you know? I can't do that. I don't have the ability to do that, you know? But God can. He has life in and of himself. 
And so he can create. So Jesus did that. He has the preeminence. He succeeded where mankind failed because he was both the perfect man and he was God in the flesh. Now, while Adam therefore passed death on to all his physical descendants, Jesus passes on something better to those who place their trust in him. He gives us a resurrection to life. He gives us eternal life with him. Now, Jesus made resurrection possible for everyone. Verse 22. For as in Adam all die, that's Adam passed that on to us, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, you might be saying, okay, what does that mean to be in Adam? I want to out of Adam. How did I get in Adam? Well, how do you get in Adam? Simple. Be born, you get to come out with the carrying card, you're a member of the club of death. All right? It's just how it is. That's why babies cry when they come out. The doctor looks at them and goes, here's your carrying card, and they cry. You know? You have joined the club of death. Right? Everyone who's born is going to die. That's the way you're born into Adam's club. The way you come into Adam's club. But just as Adam passed this on to us, Jesus passes on something that supersedes Adam's curse. And it's that same supernatural life that raised him from the dead. Now, it says here that just as how many die that come from Adam? Do believers and unbelievers die? Yes. Well, the same all will be made alive, believers and unbelievers. So the cross and the resurrection, it made possible the resurrection of every person. Now, resurrection is passed on to everyone affected by Adam's sin, therefore, not just believers. Some will say, well, wait a second, Will, does that mean everyone will be saved? Some, in fact, try to use this verse to say that it teaches everyone will be saved. This is not what this is teaching, and this does not mean that. It only states that everyone will be resurrected. You say, well, if everyone's resurrected, doesn't that mean they're good? No, there are two resurrections, a resurrection to life and a resurrection to damnation. Turn to Daniel chapter 12 with me. Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and we'll also be in John chapter 5 in a moment. Daniel 12 referring to the end of days. That's where we've been all through the prophecies of Daniel at the end here. It says, and at that time shall Michael, that's the archangel, stand up, the great prince which stands up for the children of my people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. That's referring to the great tribulation period that the book of Revelation describes. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Turn to John chapter five. We see there's two groups. All will be raised, but some to life and some to condemnation, to judgment. John chapter five, verses 26 through 29. Jesus echoes Daniel's words, similar to what I said already about Jesus, this life that he passes on to us, that he has in himself. Verse 26, John 5, for as the father has life in himself, so has he given to the son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Do not marvel at this. This is not something that should be new to you. For the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and they shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Same thing that Daniel taught. Same exact thing. This is what the scriptures consistently teach. Now you might be saying, well, wait a second, Will. You know, what about this whole he who does good? I thought it's by our faith. We'll get to that in a moment. 
But Paul ex ex uh, explained this concept even further in Philippians chapter 3, where he said there, he said, listen, my goal is to know Jesus better and, and, and to, you know, attain to the resurrection from out of the dead. Same exact phrase that he uses here in 1 Corinthians when he refers to Jesus' resurrection from out of the dead. In other words, there's a group known as the dead, all who have died and all who will die. And out of that group, there's going to be a resurrection unto life. And Paul says in Philippians 3, his goal is to be part of the resurrection of life. My goal is to attain to the resurrection from out of the dead. I don't want to be in the other group. I want to be in this group. So the idea that everyone will be saved is not biblical. The idea that everybody gets a chance after they die to repent is not biblical. The Bible says that it is appointed unto man once to die and after that judgment. That's it. So the idea is, is that there are two groups that you can be in, you know? And Paul's goal is to be part of one and not the other. So how do you join the Resurrection to Life Club? How do I leave the Resurrection to Death Club and join the Resurrection to Life Club? Well, it's just as simple as the other way. Be born, but this time be born spiritually. Be born again, the scripture says. You say, but it says here, the good and the wicked, that's how it works. Turn over to John 6 with me. John 6, 27 through 29. What did Jesus mean when he referred to the good? John 6, verse 27. He says to the crowd, labor not for the food which perishes, but for that food which endures unto everlasting life. Work for that, you know. That should be what you should be putting your, your time and your energy into, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. It's a gift. For him has God the Father sealed. You say, okay, well, it's a gift, but he gives it to us by our works. No. Verse 28, here's the big question. Then they said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Okay, you told us to labor. What do we need to do? Here it is, verse 28. Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent what it says. I'm not making this up. So we are saved by our faith, you know. Now, obviously, faith will produce good works, but my point is, is that we're saved by faith alone. We're justified by faith alone. And as we're justified, we have that promise of the resurrection unto life. If we're born again, we are part of the resurrection to life club. Awesome, right? So if you have received the Lord and you are born again, then you are part of the Resurrection to Life Club and you don't have to worry about the resurrection unto death. Then you say, okay, well, I'm part of the club. How does it work? Is it like Jesus? Do I get like three days? You know, you know is it, how, many, how many days for me? <laughs> well, when do we get our glorified bodies? Well, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23. And here we see the order of the resurrection. Verse 23. But every man in his own order. So there is an order. It's not all at the same time. That can be confusing when you read Daniel because Daniel makes it look like it's all at the same time. But there are many times in the Old Testament where it takes events that are separated by a long period of time and it smashes them together. It's just something that happens. So they don't, didn't fully understand some of the prophecies about the Messiah. In fact, the New Testament mentions they earnestly studied them because it confused them at times. In the New Testament, we get a little bit more insight. So they do not all occur at the same time. So when do they occur? Well, it mentions here every man in his own order. Now again, every man. No one is exempt from resurrection. You are going to live forever. I can say without a shadow of a doubt, every person living in this room will live forever. Why is that important? Because there are some people who are living like they won't live forever. I even heard people who've said it. Man, I'm, I'm just living for whatever because after that, it's just a big old dirt nap. I hate to break it to you. There's no dirt nap. There's no nap at all. When you close your eyes here, you wake somewhere else. Now, if you know the Lord, you wake into everlasting glory. Praise God. But if you don't know the Lord, you wake into everlasting torment, everlasting judgment. There is no nap. There is no rest. So, you need to figure out how to get to the place of everlasting life and not the place of everlasting judgment. So you will live forever. And when you get your new body, though, depends on what you did while you were in this body. 
Every man, it says, in his own order. The word there refers to a rank, a troop, or an army division. The word carries the idea of a massive army on the move divided into troops. You know, the army of humanity, as we'll see in a moment, has three groups of resurrections, and they, they come at different times. First, Jesus, Christ is the first fruits. Now, he's already received his new body, as we saw in the Gospels. It was different than his other body, where his other body was limited by time, space, and matter. His new body didn't have the same lim limitations. It was a heavenly body. And so he could, they, could, they were locked in a room, and he could just be in their midst. So it's a different body. We'll learn more about that later in 1 Corinthians 15. So Jesus is the first fruits. However, we know from the scriptures that others rose from the dead with Jesus. Turn to Matthew 27. Matthew 27, 51 through 53. This is one of those passages in the Bible where it just kind of has a walk-off. You know, the baseball season's coming to the end soon. And, you know, yeah, I was, my favorite part is like the walk-off home run. Like, you know, the walk-off hit. You know, I, I played baseball. And so you, you, I had the pleasure of having a few of those moments in my life where you get the hit that brings in the winning run. And it's just you trot to first because it is over and you did it. Well, this is like one of those moments where the Bible just knocks one out of the park and just walks off. And you're like, wait, 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 I want an explanation. And it's like, nope, sorry. It just says here in verse 51, and behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. That's how you know God tore it. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. So interestingly, if you, uh, the Mount of Olives, it's surrounded, it's a huge graveyard. The whole thing is a just graveyard these days. Surrounded by, a, you have a Muslim graveyard to the east, you have a, a Christian graveyard to the west, and then a Jewish graveyard right there all on the slopes. And the idea was, is that's where the Messiah is supposed to come back. So they want to they wanna be right there when he comes back and they get the new body and they come up. They bury him uh, uh, heads down because they figure their feet will come up and then they'll be ready. They'll be right there to see him. So that way they don't have to turn around. Um, in fact, Barbara Streisand has a lot right, right at the top. She's, it's very expensive to get at the top, but she's got one right at the top. And uh, anyway, I don't know why I told you that, but now you know. <laughs> so. These guys came out of the graves early, though. All these people who were buried around Jerusalem, they rose from the dead. This is why first fruits in 1 Corinthians 15 is plural, you know. Now, some argue, well, all the Old Testament saints received their new bodies at this time. However, Daniel 12, 1 and 2 makes it clear that most of the Old Testament saints, it says many, most of the Old Testament saints rise from the dead at the end of the tribulation period. So the best way to look at it is Jesus is leading the parade of troops with a special group of Old Testament saints. You know, you kind of have at the parade and they've got a flag, you know, or like a, a thing that shows who they are and people waving things in the front like dignitaries. That's who these guys are. The ones that got there, they got to rise with him. They are dignitaries that get to start the parade. Who they are, we don't know. The Bible doesn't say it. It just says they were saints of old. Now, next, it says afterward, which means next or later, they that are Christ's at his coming. Now, we have to define his coming a little bit here if we're going to understand what that means. Because Jesus' return is divided into two events. You have the rapture, where Jesus does not come all the way to the earth, but we meet him in the air. That's for the church, his coming, his first phase of his coming. And then we see he takes the scroll and, and during that seven years, he begins to move in on that which is rightfully his, the earth. The title deed of the earth is that scroll and he begins to cast out the, uh, the squatters. And so at the end, he comes and he returns to rule and reign. That is his second coming. So both of those events are in mind here in the second wave of resurrected people in the parade. Now the first Part of that wave is the church. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, describes how all members of the church, alive and dead, get their new bodies at the rapture. It says, that The Lord himself shall descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. He blows the trumpet, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So those who have already passed on in the Lord, they will get their resurrection bodies at that moment. And then we who are alive and remain, it says we'll be caught up into the air to be with the Lord. And so we get, we get the, the shift change on the way up. We get the new version on the way up. We are metamorphosized or changed. First Corinthians 15 at the end will describe that. So we will get into the detail on that. So we get our new bodies on the way up and then we are reunited with our, 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 the, the other saints in the church in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. 
That's phase one of this second group of resurrection. Then we read in our scripture reading in Revelation 20. It describes how the tribulation believers will rise at the second coming to rule. When Jesus comes back, Satan will be locked up for a thousand years. And at that point, when he begins his reign, it says that the Old Testament, I'm the, uh, not the Old uh, well, it does say them, but there it says those who were beheaded for their faith, who didn't take the mark of the beast and didn't worship his image, they will be made alive again and they will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. So the tribulation believers, they will get their new bodies then. And then also Daniel chapter 12, verse two, describes how Old Testament believers will rise at the second coming as well, okay? So that's part of that second wave. All those groups, the Old Testament saints, the church, and the tribulation believers, they all will receive their new bodies uh, uh, and are part of that first resurrection, the one to life, okay? Now, they occur at different moments, but they're not separated by too much time, and they're all part of what's called the first resurrection, the resurrection to life. That's where you and I will get our new bodies. They say, well, what about those who didn't place their trust in Christ? They're not mentioned here at all. Keep reading, verse 24. Then comes the end. So that's the third phase. You have Christ, the first fruits. Then all believers are part of the, what's called the first resurrection. And then you have the second resurrection, which is unbelievers. Then comes the end. The phrase there, the end, refers to the end of the resurrection march, the resurrection procession. So this is the third grouping. So when does this third group, the unbelievers, when do they get their resurrection bodies? Well, let's keep reading. Then comes the end. When? When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. When Jesus returns, he will end the rebellion of every person on the earth. And he will establish his kingdom and give us a utopia for a thousand years. During that thousand years, Satan will be locked away, unable to tempt the world. But when those thousand years are up, he'll be released so this final generation can make their choice. Everybody makes a choice. To trust the Lord and the beautiful life he'd given them for a thousand years, or to rebel in an attempt to create their own utopia without him, as mankind has so often done, again. So the idea is at the end of this thousand years, Satan will be loose and he'll begin to tempt. And he'll begin to say things like, you really think it's the best idea to follow the Lord? You really, think it's the you really think this guy has your best interest in mind? You really think his way of doing things is the best way? And people are start going, you know what? I don't like the way this is done. You know, this whole idea of utopia, this old knowledge, the idea of how we almost destroyed ourselves in the great tribulation and he had to come back and rescue us and he punished all the evildoers. You know, I bet those are people he just didn't like and he killed them all and now we have to live with it. So you know what? We're done with this. We're tired of it. We're gonna rebel. And there's gonna be a big, huge rebellion of people who say, we will not have you to be king over us. Now, Jesus will put down that rebellion. And when that rebellion is crushed, that's where we get to this point here. When he shall be, have delivered up the kingdom to God. When that rebellion is crushed, Jesus will have brought an end. The word there to put down, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, means to bring an end to. When he has brought an end to all rule, all human rule, authority and power. When that is finally accomplished, he will take the kingdom and he'll present it back to his father. Say, dad, I gave him a thousand years and they still rejected you. Of, of perfection, of, of a perfect society where there's no crime, no death, no sickness. All the things people accuse God of now. and say, well, if God is good, why does he give this? Because even if it was good, you'd still rebel. Even if it was perfect, you'd still rebel. Adam had perfection, he rebelled. And they're gonna get it again for a thousand years and they'll rebel. It's not a question of God's goodness. It's a question of your not goodness, my not goodness. When Jesus has brought an end to all rebellion against God and every man throughout history will have made their choice at that point in time, he'll hand the world back to his father and say, Father, all enemies are under my feet. I have been faithful to discharge what you have asked me to do. And at that time then, as he passes the kingdom and the earth and everything in it to the father, the Father will then destroy this universe and create a new one that's untainted by sin and by corruption and, and by death. And so at that point in time, that's when comes the end. That's when all the unrighteous will receive their resurrection bodies and they will be judged. For it says he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. 
And yet before that, before he creates this new heaven and new earth, God has one more enemy to eradicate, and it's death itself, verse 26. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. You know, it's interesting. God calls death an enemy. He's, the word enemy means to be in opposition to. I, I hear Christians sometimes say it at funerals or memorials and say, well, this is all part of God's plan. You know, death is just a cycle of life. It is not. It is not that. God is opposed to it. God hates it. God, God, it is his enemy. That is not something God created or designed. It is not part of his cycle of life. God created us to live forever with him. Death is not part of his plan. Now, obviously, the timing of our death is held in his hand, and, and the idea is he has a plan for our life, but the idea of death in, in and of itself is not part of God's plan. It's an enemy of his, of his. He's opposed to it, and he will destroy it someday. Hasten the day. Death was never meant to be part of God's plan. Adam brought it into existence through sin. And through, with the eradication of this universe, sin will be destroyed. And so death has no more place. It has no basis to exist anymore. And so death itself will be destroyed. And I remember the very first memorial I did, it was very painful for me. I was a young man. I was a young pastor. I think I'd been pastoring for maybe three years, four years at the time. And uh, after it was over, I uh, went out into the parking lot and I just, wept like a baby. And I said, God, you got to explain this to me because this doesn't feel natural at all. This feels the exact opposite of natural. This feels awful. It's horrible. I miss this person. I, I'm not going to see them for a very long time. I'm going to miss their, their wisdom, their advice, their counsel, their, their fellowship, their smile. You know, this person used to write me letters and I'm going to miss their letters. They were always praying for me. I'm going to miss them, Lord. This hurts. This stinks. And I said, Lord, I I'm not going to be satisfied leaving here until you give me an answer because I am not satisfied with the answer that this is just how things are and it's okay and you're cool with it. And as I opened my Bible and I began to pour through the scriptures, the Lord spoke to me and said, well, nowhere in the Bible does it say that I created this or this is a part of my natural order. This is nothing natural about this at all. And it was then I was able to be at peace because it was okay for it to stink. It was okay to not like it. It was okay to just cry out to him and say, Lord, I don't, I don't like this. Because the way he responded was, don't worry, son, I'm going to destroy it someday. And you'll never have to deal with it again. See, how do you know all this? How do you know this is how it's going to go down? Well, we'll turn to Revelation 20. Revelation 20. Beginning in verse 7. How do you know this is the end of the world, Pastor Will? Verse seven. And when a thousand years, Revelation 20, verse seven, that's of Christ's reign. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog. It's just a, not a place, but it's referring to just this group who holds themselves in opposition to the Lord at the end of the thousand years, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom, what a sad statement, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. That many people are gonna be, do the same thing to people. Oh, you know, that Bible stuff, that's just stories people made up to, you know, to control people. They're gonna say the same thing at the end of the millennium. Oh, that story about the great tribulation, how Jesus rescued us from it. No, that, that's just stories, man. Nuclear bombs, who would ever create bombs that could blow up the entire world? They're going to say things like that a thousand years after it's all over. We believe it's a lie. We don't think it's true. They're going to gather up. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and surround the camp of the saints about, saints about. But there's no fight this time in the beloved city. But there's no fight this time. They've made their choice. And so judgment comes. Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet already are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Aeon, ace, aeon, means time without time ending, forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face, his presence, the earth and the heaven fled away, for there was found no place for them. Jesus hands it back to the Lord. He destroys them in fervent heat, Second Peter 3 says. And so the only thing left at that point in time in our universe is this great white throne. And what happens there? Verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, which is, uh, which is uh, were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. So two books. 
A book that records all the deeds you've ever done, good and bad. And then a book of whether you put your faith in Christ or not, the book of life. And it says, the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. Let me ask you a question. What does your book look like right now? Can you honestly say, if you're honest with yourself and say, you write down everything you've ever done that's wrong, you really can honestly say, oh, I think I'm a good person. I find that to be incredibly arrogant. I know myself too well to know that that's not how my story's written. My story's written with a lot of nasty stuff in it. A lot of not good in it. Certainly not good enough for me to stand before God and say, let me in, I'm a good person, I earned my way here. Verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And so death and hell, or the grave, delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. They're done, no more grave. This is the second death. But here it is, the final resurrection and their destination forever. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Not to die, but to live there forever. This is the final resurrection, and it occurs after the destruction of our universe. The unrighteous will be brought before God, given new bodies, and then judged. And thus physical death will be destroyed, never to enter our world again. Now, our joy at the defeat of death is tempered by the sobering reality of eternal judgment. But as God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, neither should we. You know, it's interesting. The Lord says, he goes, as I live, and he does live, my soul has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his ways and live. God pleads with mankind for his entire life to turn from their wicked ways, and so should we. We should never rejoice in the death of the wicked. We should always be pleading with the wicked to turn from their ways. Please, God loves you. He, he wants to work in your life. You, need, you can be forgiven. Just turn to him. That should be our heart. And this reality of eternal judgment and Christ's love in our hearts should drive this attitude of sharing our faith. And so I ask you this morning as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, does it? Does this reality of Revelation 20 does it drive you? Does the love of Christ for those who are headed for this very real thing, does it drive you? Is it in your heart? Because if it's not, you need to ask the Lord to break your heart this morning because it's the whole reason why we celebrate what we celebrate today is that Christ's love is shed abroad in our hearts, that he died for us. But if he died for us, it means he died for them too, Right? So we need to have a love for them. We need to have a compassion for them. We need to plead with them, no matter what they think about us. You know, as the worship team comes up and the ushers prepare to hand out the elements, you know, I would ask you today, if you don't know the Lord today, you know, I do care about you. I, I care enough to say things that might upset you, things that might make you mad at me or hate me. Because see, the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 12, that there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the ways thereof lead to death. You might think you're fine. You might think I'm going down the right road, but I'm pleading with you this morning. That way leads to an eternal fire forever and ever or the smoke of your torment. Do you, I can't even comprehend the concept. You know, I, I had one time when I was uh, cooking, you know, uh, which is very rare, one time. It's probably only five times I've done it. But I was cooking. And, and, and I touched uh, the, the pan and it, I could hear the searing of it. I can't even fathom the idea of burning forever. You give it a new body that can endure that and you'll burn forever. I can't even fathom that. But that is the eternity you are headed to if you don't know the Lord. I don't care if that offends you because I care about you. So my urging to you is please repent. Please turn to Christ. He loves you. He doesn't want you to go there. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life with him, the resurrection to life. You say, well, how do I know your way's right? How do I know your way is not the way of death? How do I know my way's right? Well, David, a great sinner, <laughs> he said this. This was his prayer. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Have you ever done that? 
Have you ever just gotten alone with the Lord and said, okay, God, if you're real, search my heart. Show me the wickedness that's there. If I'm so wicked, if I need a Savior, then show me the wickedness that's in there. Show me, try me, test me. That's what that means, test me. And know my thoughts. If, he, if you're really God and you know everything out there, then, then show me. You know what I've been thinking about. You know what's in my heart. Show me where I've been wicked. Show me I need a Savior and lead me in the everlasting way. I promise you. I promise you, if you say that sincerely, he will. He will without a shadow of a doubt because the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, if, if we examine our own hearts, we can justify ourselves. We could say, well, there's reasons I did that, or there's reasons I, you know, you know the, there were circumstances, you know, of why I behaved that way. But when God gets alone with you and he begins to put his finger on those things, you can't, you got no excuses for it. So my question to you this morning, if you don't know him, is have you ever taken the time to do that? As the elements are passed out, here's what I would ask you. Please don't not do that. Please ask the Lord, say, Lord, okay, search me. Because my goal would be is that when he reveals himself to you and you put your faith in Christ, then you can take that bread and take that cup and you can make the same declaration we're all about to make, which is Christ died for me. Amen? Okay. Well, Lord, we give you this time now and, and to reflect on you, to ask you to search our hearts, see if there be any wicked way in us, Lord, because you stepped into our world to rescue us from sin. And so, Lord, we wanna live as those who have been rescued. Lord, change us, we pray. Make us more like you, even as we reflect on what you did for us. In Jesus' name, amen.